Beloved community, grace and peace to you from the God who neither slumbers nor sleeps, the one who keeps our going out and our coming in, the maker of heaven and earth. Whether you are part of First Church, an inclusive and justice-seeking church in the heart of our nation's capital, or whether you are a guest or friend joining us from many different locations, we welcome you to worship on this post-election Sunday. As part of our stewardship season, we will be blessed to hear a heartfelt stewardship moment from Priscilla Waters. And we are delighted this morning to welcome the Reverend Dr. Donique McIntosh as our guest preacher. Her photograph and bio appear in your worship folder, and I know we will be deeply inspired by her word for us this morning. Helping us with technology, Alex Chang will serve as our Zoom moderator, and Tom Sowers as our sound designer here in the sanctuary. Thank you to both of them for making this service possible. Following worship, we will enjoy a Zoom coffee hour and a study of the prophets for perilous times with the Reverend Dr. Ron Hobson. All are welcome to take part. Friends, no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome into this shared experience of worshiping the God whose love knows no bounds. Let us worship together, beginning with our opening hymn, O God, our help in ages past. Our opening hymn this morning is Our God, Our Help in Ages Past. Please join the choir and me in singing all stanzas after a brief introduction. Church. This is Anissa and Beatrice. 
What a day for wonder and gratitude. I, I think we can all agree that wonder and gratitude are amplified in community. And it's so good to be with you guys today. I am in wonder of the sacrifices and dedication of those who worked for this political moment in our country right now, including those in our community. I am in gratitude for the long road that has prepared our next president to lead in this difficult moment. I'm in wonder that my daughter will see a woman <laughs> in the level of leadership that no American girl has ever been able to see before. I am in gratitude that we will have the wind at our back for a little while at least in the fight for justice and dignity for all our neighbors. And I look forward today to talking and thinking with all of you about who is our neighbor and, and how we show up for our neighbor today. Let us worship together. Good morning, First Church. It is so great to see you. Good morning. Good morning. Hey, Bear. Hey, Sheep. It's great to see you, too. Good to see you, Reverend Sam. Good to see you. Today is a very special Sunday. We have a wonderful friend, the Reverend Dr. Donique McIntosh, who will be giving the sermon. Welcome, Dr. McIntosh. Welcome. And she's going to be preaching upon the Good Samaritan story. Oh, I really like that story. That is the story of how the Samaritan helps the man in the ditch. And not only does he, the Samaritan help the man, but the Samaritan goes above and beyond. You know what, Reverend Sam? W what's that, Bear? We like to call that the N and D types of stories in the Bible. I have never, ever heard of N and Ds. You've never heard of N and Ds? We did not cover that in seminary. Wow, I can teach you something. What's that, Bear? So the N stands for notice. And the D stands for do something. Hmm. So like in this story, the lawyer and the priest, they notice the man. But they don't do anything. That's right, Reverend Zim. And then the good Samaritan comes by and he notices and he does something about it. That's amazing. And you know what's really amazing? What's that, Sheepy? The Good Samaritan doesn't think too much about it. He doesn't think about, is he qualified to help? Does he have all the degrees? Does he have the permission? He just thinks, I will use all my gifts and skills to help this person. That is a really powerful lesson. Do you think that can apply to us? Of course, Reverend Sam. We should use all the gifts we have, and through the grace of God, they will be enough to help our neighbor. So let's think about some examples about how we can notice and do something. Oh, oh, I know one, I know one. Okay, let's say you're walking down the street and you see some trash. You notice the trash and you do something by picking it up. Oh, that's a great example. I have something too. Let's say you are at your school and people are being picked on and you notice that people are being picked on and you walk over and you say, that is not cool. This is my friend. I will protect him. Go away. Oh, that is very brave of you, Bear. That is a great example of noticing and doing. Let me think, I got one more thing. Um, yes, one more example would be sometimes we notice that people might be sad. Sometimes people would know really well and sometimes we people we don't know really well and if we notice that we should go over and say hey are you okay i'm just checking on you oh sheepy that's so nice so you're noticing and you're just kind of politely going over there and making sure they're okay well that's great well friends this has been really helpful let's say a prayer loving god loving god we are grateful we are grateful for all our neighbors and please give us the courage to notice how we can be good neighbors and to do something about it amen amen bye friends bye friends bye friends, bye friends. thank you baron sheepy 
Thank you, God, for giving us the love and courage to notice and do something as we love our neighbor and our world. And now let us celebrate being a community of God's children by sharing the peace of Christ with one another. May peace be with you. Peace, everybody. Peace, everybody. Peace, everybody. Amen. Amen. It is a great day. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Go, Joe. Amen. Peace. 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 <laughs> Good morning again, First Church. I'm honored today to share why I commit my money and time to the church. As a result of COVID-19, I'm standing in the pulpit in front of empty pews, addressing you on Zoom. In spite of my inability to physically draw strength and comfort from you, I am spiritually buoyed by this First Church congregation. We describe ourselves on our website as a community of welcome and compassion, asking questions and seeking answers together. I asked questions and sought answers with some of you when we read esteemed theologian Dr. James Cone's book, the cross and the lynching tree together and discovered a credo that speaks to the important work of First Church. Dr. Cohn cites the words of German refugee Joachim Prince, who shared the following with him during the March on Washington, and I quote, when I was a rabbi of the Jewish community in Berlin under the Hitler regime, the most important thing I learned under those tragic circumstances was that bigotry and hatred are not the most urgent problems. The most urgent and disgraceful, the most shameful, the most tragic problem is silence. I feel drawn to First Church because throughout our 150 year history, Members have refused to stay silent in the face of injustice. Founded by abolitionist, courageous congregation members spoke up when segregationist members denied seating to men and women of African descent, creating one of Washington, D.C.'s first integrated congregations. And the uh, ancestor who I commemorate on my T-shirt, who was a free man at Appomattox, a blacksmith could have come and worshiped here at First Church. More recently, First Church members refused to stay silent when our lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer LGBTQ brothers and sisters were persecuted and discriminated against. We declared ourselves an open and affirming church that invites everyone to worship here and celebrates same-sex marriages in our sanctuary. When the previous administration, yay, imposed draconian immigration policies, First Church refused to say, stay silent. Declaring ourselves a sanctuary church, and supporting organizations advocating more humane immigration policies. Reverend Sam is teaching our youth not to stand, stand silently by while the history and culture of our indigenous brothers and sisters on the Cheyenne River Re Indian Reservation is allowed to die. And they learn to understand their privilege by volunteering in inner city Baltimore, Maryland. We also raise our voices internationally, demanding the end of South African apartheid and crying out that building peace in Colombia requires justice. I promise to make these comments brief, but please be patient while I talk about this summer. 
First Church spoke up when George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Ahmed Arbery became victims of unjust law enforcement practices and vigilante murder. First Church honored them and others when we held signs, knelt, read their names, and prayed in front of our church. And we continue to ask questions and seek answers together about eradicating racial injustice in white privilege and sacred conversations to end racism. Let me close by saying again that I pledge my time and money to First Church because we are a compassionate congregation that asks questions and seeks answers together and refuses to stay silent in the face of injustice. Precious words from Luke chapter 10, uh, verses 25 through 37. Just then a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus replied, what is written in the law? What do you read there? The lawyer answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus replied, you have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, the lawyer asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him and went away leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, 
and took care of him. The next day, he took, took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the one who fell into the hands of the robbers? The lawyer said, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. Amen. It is my joy and my privilege to introduce this morning our guest preacher, the Reverend Dr. Donique McIntosh. She is a native of Cleveland, Ohio. She graduated from Fisk University and went on to earn a master's degree from the University of Tennessee and Vanderbilt Divinity School and a doctorate in social justice education at University of Massachusetts Amherst. A minister and social justice educator, Dr. McIntosh is committed to using her voice to work for liberation from oppression with individuals, faith communities, and organizations. Over the last 15 years, she has developed anti-oppression related curricula, aided in creating welcoming and affirming spaces for LGBT people, and trained leaders around the country in working for social change. Her calling to advocate for social justice has led her to colleges, nonprofits, national conferences, state legislative offices, and the White House. Reverend McIntosh's writing has appeared in scholarly journals and the Huffington Post. She currently serves as the Minister for Racial Justice of the Southern New England Conference of the United Church of Christ. I am grateful to call her a colleague and friend. Welcome, Dr. McIntosh. Thank you. Good morning. I bring you greetings, as Amanda said, from the Southern New England Conference of the United Church of Christ, where I serve as the Minister for Racial Justice. I'm grateful for the opportunity to be in worship uh, with you all virtually, uh, especially amidst our current climate. So thank you, Pastor, uh, for the invitation. Let us pray. Giver of life, help us to hear an old story in a new way. With open ears and open hearts, with your eyes, may we see ourselves and each other. Challenge us, disrupt us, afflict us. Speak, Lord, for your beloved children are listening. Amen. May 23rd, 1994, I started my new job as a claim rep for State Farm Insurance Company. Based in Bowling Green, Kentucky, which I affectionately call Boring Green, I worked in auto claims and handled the personal injury protection coverage. In layperson's terms, that means that if someone was in an auto accident, I was the person who paid their medical bills, lost wages, and survivor's benefits if the accident was fatal. And as part of my indoctrination into the state farm way of life, I had to attend claim school. So I went away to Bloomington, Illinois for three weeks for claim school. And during those three weeks, I attended training sessions at the company's headquarters that lasted all day met new colleagues from across the country, and started learning the company's history. One of the first things we learned was the story of State Farm's founding by G.J. Mahurl. Mahurl founded State Farm in 1922, and his goal was simple, offer competitive prices and be there for neighbors when trouble struck. That's how they gained their reputation for being good neighbors. Being there was synonymous with good neighbor. How many of you can remember that catchy jingle they had? Anybody? Well, I hope you can remember because trust me, you don't, you don't wanna hear me sing it. And guided by the founder's vision, State Farm's continued mission is to be the first and the best choice in the products and services they provide. Now that's pretty ambitious. Not just an ambitious mission, it's a code of conduct of sorts for employees. 
To say that you aspire to be the first choice that people think of when they need help and to outdo the competition when providing service means that everything the company says and does has to answer the question of whether it helps State Farm be the first and the best choice. They have a code of conduct. They have a code of conduct and so do we as followers of Jesus. Our founder, if you will, put it this way, love God, love self, love neighbor. It's as simple and as challenging as that Everything else we do as disciples hangs on these commandments according to the version of the story in Matthew. And in the Luke text for today, Jesus is recorded as telling the lawyer that loving God, loving oneself and loving one's neighbor are the standards by which we measure how well we live. Therefore, to love is to act, to love is to live. Loving is to be a way of life for the disciple. It's not something we do once and get to check off our to-do list. And it's within this context that the lawyer asks, wait a minute, Jesus, love God, check, love self, check, love neighbor. Hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. Now, when you say neighbor, you mean all of them? All of them all the time? Now, I don't know that I would have been looking for little phones with Jesus on this, but this lawyer asked a question. And I can understand this question though, can you? I mean, I've had some neighbors whose behavior left me with less than neighborly thoughts and feelings. Can I just tell the truth? There was a neighbor who tried to keep my package when it was mistakenly delivered to his house. He had opened it and everything. There was a neighbor who parked his car in my assigned parking spot. And there was a neighbor who smoked so much weed and cigarettes that my den smelled like I smoke weed and cigarettes. There was a neighbor who ran his dogs around his apartment so loudly that it smelled like, I mean, that it sounded like wild stallions lived next door to me. That same neighbor bounced a tennis ball off his bedroom wall at night, preventing me from sleeping. So I can see why this lawyer might have wondered how far Jesus wanted him to take this love your neighbor thing. And instead of just answering simply, he decided to tell a story called a parable. And if we spent any time in church, we probably heard this story told. Some of us have probably told it ourselves. The story goes that there was a guy, a random person from what we could tell, who was on his way to Jericho and was robbed, stripped, and beaten, and then left for dead. A priest was going down the road and saw the person and crossed the road as he kept walking. Later, a Levite came walking by and saw the person and crossed the road too. But the Samaritan, Instead of widening the distance between them, close the distance. He came near, then he saw him. It was his seeing him that resulted in his being moved and it was his being moved that led him to act. Now, all of this is instructive, of course. I mean, if you're like me, you can readily identify with these three characters. There have been days when I've been too afraid, too apathetic, too oblivious, too in the middle of something else to respond to someone in need. I'm sure there are times we haven't even noticed the person in need, let alone responded. And despite our reasons or our reservations, God expects us to notice and to act. And the Samaritan gives us a good example of what most of us do on our good days or in our better moments. The first thing I noticed about the telling of the Samaritan's part of the story is that he came near to the guy in need. I'll admit that my first instinct isn't to get closer. I'm not like the firefighter or the police officer rushing in when there's danger. In those instances, we might be more like the two who cross to the other side. Perhaps driven more by our fear and questions than our mercy, we decide to leave the neighborliness to someone else. I can even recall when I did my residency as a chaplain at a major hospital in Chicago. When I was on call and the pager went off, on my good days, I was like the Samaritan, drawing near, soothing wounds with my words, spending my time and other resources tending to and looking after patients and their families. Yet there were other days when the patient went off and I had to go to a wing in the hospital that scared me for one reason or another. I wondered if I was up to the task. I wondered if I could do the things that were required of me. Fortunately, my obligation outweighed my doubts and I went to where I'd been called. I can certainly understand our humanly inclinations to hesitate. As a woman, if I saw a guy stranded on the side of the road, 
my willingness to be neighborly would certainly be in question. Add the guy's race, time of day or night, and appearance to the equation, and I'm looking more and more like the priest and Levite by the seconds. I understand the inclination to some extent to hesitate, to refuse, to opt out, to sit on the sidelines, to ignore. And yet I know the neighborliness isn't defined by the who in the scenario, but by the what that needs to be done. The better question we might ask ourselves is, whose neighbor am I? In so doing, we rightly locate ourselves as the actor, as the one whose very existence is grounded in loving everyone, regardless of who they are. In other words, we love them not because of who they are, but because of who we are, because of whose we are. We love them because we know the ethical demand placed on us. We love but because we understand that to love one's neighbor is to love God and to love God is to love one's neighbor. Despite our commands to love, loving is made more complicated by things like stereotypes. Psychologists define stereotypes as images, ideas, and traits that we associate with groups of people. There are structures in our minds and we all do it. For instance, when I say the word Southerner, you probably get an image in your mind of what that means to you. And the trouble with stereotypes is that they aren't often based on our actual experiences with people from that particular group. And people also commonly use stereotypes to fill in details about people who are not members of their in-group and when they're not motivated to get to know them on a more personal basis. And what happens is that we apply these stereotypes that we have for a group of people to encounters with any person from that group. And people generally see others as members of groups before responding to them as individuals. Now, why is this important? In an article published in 2013, researchers who study what's known as the racial empathy gap showed a group of white participants a video clip of a needle or eraser touching someone's skin and measured their reactions. Now, typically when we see someone in pain, it triggers the same network in our brains that's triggered when we're personally hurt. They found that people do not respond to the pain of others equally. In this experiment, when viewers saw white people receiving a painful stimulus, they responded more dramatically than they did for black people. The racial empathy gap helps explain disparities in everything from pain management with doctors to the criminal justice system. It's not just that white people disregard the pain of black people, for instance. It's as if they think the pain isn't even felt. This impacts our willingness to intervene, to act, to love our neighbor. And yet the command is there. And Luke the Samaritan is held up as our exemplar. He's the one we should model our behavior after, the text tells us. He's the one who's good because of what he does. As compelling an example as a Samaritan is for us, there's something else here that begs for our attention. Noted scholar in New Testament and Jewish studies at Vanderbilt Divinity School, and one of my favorite professors, A.J. Levine, wrote in her book, Short Stories by Jesus, that what makes the parables mysterious or difficult is that they challenge us to look into the hidden aspects of our own values, our own lives. They bring to the surface unasked questions and they reveal the answers that we've always known but refuse to acknowledge. Our reaction to them should be one of resistance rather than acceptance. Religion, she says, has been defined as designed to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. We do well to think of the parables of Jesus as doing the afflicting. Therefore, if we hear a parable and think, I really like that, or worse, fail to take any challenge, we aren't listening well enough. The truth is that a lot of us Christians hear this familiar story and easily identify with the priest, the Levite, and the Samaritan. We see ourselves, right? We see those values Professor Levine mentions in all their humanly glory. Still, I believe that there's another story that forces us to look at our values, challenges us to rethink what good means or who we think of as good. Taking Professor Levine's words to heart, how might we hear the story if we put ourselves in the position of the person on the side of the road? Imagine that you're in a ditch on the side of the road. You're feeling vulnerable, possibly in physical pain or maybe a bruised ego kind of pain. 
Your self-confidence might have taken a hit because of whatever happened. And hello, you're naked. You want somebody to help. And you need help. And the people you might expect to stop and help, like Reverend Amanda or Reverend Sam, they just keep walking right on by. But along comes this person. The person who stops to help you isn't someone necessarily you'd expect to help. According to Professor Levine, to understand the parable as did its original audience, we need to think of Samaritans less as oppressed benevolent figures and more as the enemy, as those who do the oppressing. From the perspective of the man on the side of the road, Jewish listeners might resist the idea of receiving Samaritan aid, she said. To them, the word good generally wouldn't even be an adjective used to describe a Samaritan. It'd be like calling a murderer good. Now remember, there was a long and documented hate between Jews and Samaritans. To us, the Samaritan is the hero of the story. To Jewish listeners, the Samaritan being characterized in a positive, helpful way was shocking and probably disorienting. For me, it's helpful to think back to those neighbors I mentioned earlier. In my mind, neighbors are respectful of their neighbors and just and thus quiet. Neighbors park in their, their own assigned parking spots. If they smoke weed and or cigarettes, they do it so I don't have to smell it in my house. Neighbors are the people you ask to get your mail when you're gonna be out of town. Not the people who take your packages, open them and refuse to give them back. Needless to say, I didn't hold these neighbors in high regard. I didn't build relationships with them or strike up conversations with them. I will say that had they ever been in need, I likely would have helped. My heart would have gone out to them as it did with the Samaritan. What would have been infinitely more difficult for me would be being on the receiving end of their beneficence. I had already made up my mind about who they were. My depiction of them mattered more to me than God's image in them. Being a neighbor is not just about giving. It's also about receiving and being open to trusting. It's one thing to be a neighbor who gives and it's quite another to be a neighbor who receives from someone who othered. We all have them. Who's your person? Who's the person or people you'd have trouble thinking of as good? Maybe it's the person you've been taught to fear or the person you've been taught has stolen your job or your spot at so-and-so college whose hand you have trouble taking if it was outstretched in front of you. Maybe it's the person you've been socialized to think is inferior to you who's standing there. Maybe it's someone wearing a Blue Lives Matter t-shirt or one of the 70 million people who voted for the other side. Imagine that the last person on the planet you'd want to be vulnerable with, stand naked emotionally or otherwise in front of, be indebted to, or have to get assistance from, is right there with what you need in their hand. How far do we have to take this love your neighbor thing, Jesus? Whose neighbor am I? If you work for State Farm, you know who the good neighbor is in our business. Do we? Amen. Still water.
simply beautiful, Marion. Thank you so much. Such a gift to our community. Good morning, friends. It is a delight to be with you on this beautiful day in the nation's capital. You may have heard sounds of jubilee yesterday in your neighborhood. In my neighborhood, it was nonstop happy honking of horns, cheers from strangers in the streets, ringing cowbells, a shofar blowing loudly from our Jewish neighbors down the street, and even two French horn players performing a concert at Fort Reno Park. So as I reflect upon this moment, I've been trying to put some language to what I've been feeling. First, I thought of the Hebrew word for spirit, ruach, which means breath, as God is breathing new winds of justice, inclusion, decency, and hope into our lives and our community. Second, I thought of the story of the prodigal child. For many of us, this is a prodigal parent moment, a moment where a country we love deeply had strayed. And while the road ahead will not be easy, we run to embrace the prodigal country who has turned to herself reclaiming God's call to do justice, to show mercy, and to walk humbly with God. But then yesterday, as I was volunteering with our youth, raking leaves, cutting back shrubs, helping Miss Wilson live in our home more easily with Seabury, I was reminded of Reverend Dr. King's drum major instinct sermon, where he tells us that to be great all you need to do is to serve others. Clearly, yesterday was a moment created by such greatness of so many regular people. People committed to serving others, people who failed to give up on America's promise that your vote counts, that your voice counts, and the fact that it was the efforts of amazing black, brown, Asian, Muslim, LGBT, Native American and women activists, the very people who, who have felt the brunt of oppression these last four years, that have led, helped us lead us to the promised land, that fact should not be lost on any of us. It is also a powerful reminder about why this community is so special, how this community strives for greatness by serving others by loving more, by being more just, by doing whatever we can to be more inclusive. And while these last four years have not been easy, while many of us have felt that we have been existing with a dark cloud over us, we remain grateful for a God that has stood with us and a community that allows us to answer God's call to be great. Four years ago, it was the Women's Rights um, March where we served, the Trans Visibility March we served for becoming a sanctuary church, ending the medical debt, for praying and striving to be more anti-racist and more inclusive, for caring though, for those who have been hurt by the pandemic, for all these we've served, for the drop-in center for our homeless youth we serve. For volunteering in communities near and far, we serve. And it is this very commitment to living out our faith through our commitment to serving others that we remind one another who our God is, what our faith is all about, and that with God and with one another, we will be okay. So thank you, First Church. So in gratitude for who we are and who God calls us to be, let us take up the offering we recognize it as stewardship season. We, re we thank Priscilla for her wonderful testimony. Please go to the, our website to learn more. And now I thank John for leading us in the doxology.
friends, we've come to the time in our service where we share in the joys and burdens that each one brings. We go to God in prayer together and close with the prayer of our Savior, which is found in your worship folder. I invite you, if there are prayers of the people that you would like to lift up, please feel free to share those in the chat box. Sam will be collecting and speaking those as I share these prayer requests that have already come in. Healing prayers for Larissa, daughter of Scott Prentice, who has been admitted to the hospital after contracting COVID-19. She's in a great deal of pain and all of your prayers would be appreciated. Prayers of gratitude for those who organized, educated, and got out the vote this year, including our own Sandy Sorensen, who led the UCC's Our Faith, Our Vote effort. Gratitude for those who worked the polls in this challenging election, and for those who faithfully continue to count ballots. We especially give thanks for the faithful commitment and labor of black women in making our democracy work. Prayers of thanksgiving for the Reverend James Ross, who has been called to serve as an area conference missioner in the Southern New England Conference of the United Church of Christ, where he will oversee 111 congregations in the Northeast around Boston. We celebrate with him. Likewise, we celebrate that the Reverend Dr. Audrey Price has been called to serve as the executive for missional implementation in the Southern New England Conference. We look forward to Dr. Price being with us as a guest preacher once more before she departs for her new role. Prayers for those impacted by Hurricane Eta in Nicaragua, Honduras, and Guatemala, and now Cuba, and especially for those in poor communities. Prayers of thanksgiving for President-elect Joe Biden, and Vice President-elect Kamala Harris, and prayers of hope that our country can come together and work together. Sam, what other prayers would you share? Well, just great gratitude and joy uh, for our youth for serving uh, with Seabury yesterday. I want to thank Tadashi and Patrick and, and, and Joseph and Jessica. It was a beautiful day to be there. And it, what made it really joyful was that, that Grandin Purnell was with us. He is not only a beloved member of our church community, but he is a volunteer coordinator for Seabury. So to be with him, to catch up with him and his family was a, a real joy. So Wonderful. prayers of gratitude for that. And prayers of thanksgiving. Yeah. And we, prayers to San, for, for the wonderful parents, too. Cynthia and Matthew and Matt were wonderful, too. So we're lifting up those prayers. And their friend, Augustina, who's hopefully going to join our young adults. Um, and the youth are continuing on their justice journey with the center. They're going to meet for their second to last time this Sunday. And we're talking about prayer stations, about how we can spiritually and, and, and through discipleship live out our faith. So I'm grateful for all 12 of them for, um, for covenanting with this justice journey. So thank you. Thank you, Sam. Restoring the soul of our nation. Friends, let us pray. Eternal God, thank you for keeping us this week. In the chaos and uncertainty, in the disappointment and relief, in the heart sickness and hope for a new start, even in moments of celebration, oh God, you held us this week in a love that is greater than ourselves. Thank you. Help us also to keep one another. May we guard each one's dignity and bind up the brokenhearted, heal the great wound of the soul of our nation, born of the failure to live into your call to love our neighbors as ourselves. May that call this morning echo anew in our hearts. May it bring our feet to walk in the ways of Jesus 
and our mouths to sing of freedom. May it compel us to link arms and do the work of justice together, pressing toward your vision. Oh God, we lift up to you all those suffering in this moment in human history, the forgotten and abused, those trying to numb the pain with addiction. We lift up to you all those who have fallen ill with COVID-19 and their loved ones. Help our nation to get a grip on this disease, oh God, that we might once again live in healthy communities where we can be together without fear. We lift up the poor around the world. We give thanks for all of those essential workers and poll workers and election officials who worked around the clock this week so that we could enjoy a free and fair election in which every vote is counted. May we honor their labor and sacrifice. Be with us in these weeks and months ahead, O oh God. We do not pretend to know what they will hold. May our trust in your presence only strengthen. May our reliance on your love only increase. Help us to pause in holy wonder too, O oh God, in the beauty of these warm fall days, that we might join the praise of the trees and the sun. May gratitude fall upon us once more as we pray together the prayer Jesus taught the disciples, found in your worship folder. Our God, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, I invite you to join us in our closing hymn, Now Thank We All Our God.
Before Dr. McIntosh offers our final blessing, I want to remind you to check our newsletter, website, and Facebook page for announcements. If you are a new guest worshiping with us today, I invite you to complete the visitor's information form. The link can be found in our worship folder. Following this service, join us for our Zoom coffee hour. Dr. Hobson's study of the Prophets for Perilous Times will begin on a separate Zoom call at 1140. The link is in your inbox as well as your worship folder. And I want to once again thank the Reverend Dr. Donique McIntosh for her powerful presence and word for us today. I now invite her to bless us as we depart from worship. Please join me in a closing benediction. Oh God who loves us, it is in you that we find our being and our calling. It is you who calls us to love you with all that we are and have. It is you who calls us to love our neighbors as ourselves. Go now in love as neighbors, neighbors who give to and receive from one another. Go now in love, in love that will change the world. Amen. <laughs>